cool. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about um, obviously FTHC. You know, you've said it's sort of you. Um, obviously, your history with Million Dead and, and in the punk scene, and you've done a lot of folk, all kinds of stuff. I mean, this album you see is getting back to your punk roots. I mean, how did that? So, was that like a conscious decision, or did it just kind of happen? <clears throat> Um, kind of a little bit of both. I mean, I try to write in an unforced way. I try not to decide what I'm going to write about ahead of time and just sort of let things arrive. And there was some specific stuff as well. I mean, in, um, in the summer of 2019, I did a bunch of festivals, like in particular, we did, um, uh, punk rock holiday, which is in Slovenia. And it was like Pennywise and Descendants and that kind of thing. And then us and I just kind of I was quite honored to be there, given that I just released an electro pop record and then a history folk podcast album. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and we we went on and we we held our ground, which was pretty cool. But I remember walking around in the day sort of feeling like I was at home musically and that I maybe hadn't been home for a little while and that there would be a nice place to spend a bit of time. So, so I was kind of wandering down those roads. I mean, it should also be noted that like whilst this is emphatically not a lockdown record, because I think there's already enough of those and I'm hoping that we will soon reach a time when the idea of singing songs about lockdown is beyond tedious. We're not there yet. Um, uh, but, um, you know, of course the album is overshadowed by lockdown in many different ways because we're living through this world historical event. And with reference to this, like what would have originally been kind of a couple of cautious steps down a certain kind of musical path became like a headlong sprint after I had to spend like nearly two years doing nothing at all and <laughs> other than reworking songs and pushing the boundaries and kind of going ah it's, it's could be faster it could have more guitars you know what i mean and um so it's definitely like been sort of concentrated in a way um uh by by the process of lockdown definitely that makes sense and then you know on this record obviously having like jason isabel or these people that are you know such talented kind of performers sure. and songwriters who definitely you know, I don't, I guess, associate, you know, Jason with, with punk. Oh, maybe, sure. Maybe. Yeah, 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 totally. But but also, you know, um, I feel like from a songwriting perspective, like him or even someone like Scott Hutchison have this way of writing songs that is so kind of uniquely them. I mean, what was it like kind of bringing in some of the other people, kind of the logistics of COVID aside? Sure. Well, actually, weirdly, the logistics was were, were pretty easy. And then, of course, the personal logistics of it, like so with Jason, Jason is a shredder like he is a serious fucking shredder and it doesn't really come across in his recorded or live performed music but I've seen that guy sound check a lot and like when he gets to sound check he's like fucking Ingvi Malmsteen you know and um <laughs> I wanted I wanted a kind of slightly OTT guitar solo on that track that was kind of beyond my skills and and the skills of my band members so we were just like casting around and it was like fuck it I'll ask Jason and this happened with most of the people we asked to be guests he was just like I'm so fucking bored like send me the track <laughs> send me the track and I'll get this done today do you know what I mean like I'm sitting in my house doing nothing at all um, so we had him with Simon from Biffy Clyro sings on the Resurrectionist which was again I mean I've known Simon since the beginning of recorded time and um it was a lovely thing, actually. <laughs> and then, I mean, the other thing, of course, is the drummers. There's four different drums on this record. And, uh, and I've never met any of them. Um, uh, Dom from Muse uh, played on The Gathering. Elan from Nine Inch Nails played on everything else, apart from one or two. Uh, Jason from Death Cab played on Wave Across a Bay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's cool. I mean, I, and I do feel quite strongly that part of the reason this record works to the extent that I think it works, which obviously I think is quite far, but never mind, um, is because the old the old saw about how you rock as hard as your drummer. Like, an, a, you know, I wanted this to be a more aggressive record, and the opportunity to work with Elan is incredible. Not least because that motherfucker hits his drums very, very hard. But yeah, you know, and there's a, there's definitely a kind of a level of like aggression and energy that comes from behind the kit on this record, which I, is is kind of new territory for me, and I and I like it a lot. I mean. How do you kind of balance that? Because the record is very aggressive, but also very melodic. Like, where do you sure. sort of draw? Do you draw the line when you're like, okay, like, I can't have like a thrash song on here? Or like, how do you know what kind of works? Because I feel like there's a very broad spectrum. Sure. Well, I mean, one of the, so this, one of the nice things, I'm 40 years old and this is my ninth record. Those are two ridiculous statements, but they're both true. And like, it's very liberating being on a ninth record because there's no cliches about the difficult ninth album. You know what I mean? Like, who gets to make nine albums? Beethoven or whatever. I don't know. But like, um, it's uh, 
it's you know and there's a certain kind of liberty that comes with that and in particular with the fact that i do it on my own name like it's my songs and there was a like particularly with this record i wrote the riff for non serbia and it automatically kind of thought well that's a side project of some kind somewhere down the line and then it was like fuck it why do you know what i mean like i i, I can put whatever i want on my records yeah fair enough yeah um i'm curious like you know obviously there's a lot of really personal moments on the record Father, fatherless obviously or um you know a lot of the a lot of the album i mean do you think this is your most personal record or do you think they're all personal in their own way or how do you kind of view it um i think that it's kind of in some ways it's kind of a return um secondly i'm, I'm older than the last time around i did this so there are a different things to say but also you know one of the consolations of aging is that you're more secure in yourself as an individual i find and standing on firmer ground enables you to fish in deeper waters um i mean i had this thing in my early records i used to call it the wince and the wince is when you write a lyric and then you go ah um and because it's like jesus christ don't say that um and then it's like if you do that you have to keep it in because what you've just done is provoked a reaction in yourself before it even got recorded you know what i mean and that's something and just in terms of my taste in music you know i always adored like arab strap um Cat and Crows, whatever, like um, just music and Pedro the Lion as well is a huge thing for me. And like just those moments which are just like totally irretractable, you know, I like that when somebody says something and you kind of glance at your speaker and go, fucking hell, like, did he just say what I thought he said that kind of thing? I think that's kind of cool. So I perceive that in my music. Well, yeah, um, I'm almost done, but I'm curious, like, um, you know, a wave across a bay. I mean, why why was it important for you to kind of write that song? And like, was that a difficult thing to kind of um, write about? I guess. I you know the the process of writing it wasn't hard. The process of kind of like getting the presentation right was more challenging. Um, this is a weird story. It's a true story. Um, I feel slightly uncomfortable telling it, and to the extent it's mentioned in the lyrics itself. But essentially, I had a lucid dream a couple of months after Scott died, which featured Scott playing me some guitar chords and singing me some words. And I wrote them down when I woke up and, and made a voice note and then went back to sleep and then woke up the next day and had two thirds of a song. And sort of, so it arrived easily, I guess you would say. I mean, I guess what we're talking about here is a reasonably extreme form of grieving, ultimately. Um, but it's still quite fucking weird. Um, and, you know, I put the song together and then I, I did a demo of it. And right from the word go, the idea was to arrange it in a way that felt like a Frank Rabbit song. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a sense of homage there. And the light in your eyes as you realize you were finally escaping. But so when it came to finishing the song, it was like, I need to play this to someone in that camp. Um, so I reached out to Grant. Um, his brother, who's in the band as well, obviously, and who I'd, I'd met like once prior to this. Um, and Grant was actually an absolute darling. I sent him a demo of the song and he just wrote back and said, well, I'm not going to listen to all of that. Thank you very much. But he said, I think my brother would want you to put this out. And I think that we dealt in emotionally visceral and unforgiving music. And it would be kind of ridiculous for me to try and censor that. And I understand that you're coming from the right place on this. So, you know, he gave it his blessing. Um, and then, you know, recording it was hard. I mean, singing it was hard. And, you know, that, so I, I would, there was some elements of kind of concern about the presentation of it and just trying to make sure that it didn't seem kind of in any conceivable way exploitative. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I really think Scott is going to be one of those guys like Nick Drake or something where like 30, 40 years from now, people are going to be rediscovering those records or discovering oh, them. People absolutely. Um, my last question, I guess, is like, what, like, what is the plan for here? I mean, I know everything's sort of changing. Like, are you, sure. do, you do you miss touring? I mean, do you want to get on the road? Like, what's sort of the plan from here? I guess not the record. Yeah. Going um, I mean, I'm sort of professionally obliged to be an optimist right now. Um, I'm sure yeah. you know what I'm talking about. You know, you have to just sort of plan for the best and hope for the worst or something. I don't know. But, but um, uh, you know, this is a record, despite the fact that it was constructed in quite a sort of like artificial long distance kind of way the intention behind it is very much for it to be played in sweaty rooms with bodies flying and people stage diving and all the rest you know um so i'm looking forward to doing that when is that going to happen i don't know like in, in terms of missing the road i mean yeah i can't really t do this without quoting Joni mitchell but fuck it um like you don't know what you got till it's gone there's something so self-sufficient about surviving on the road you know um and about being able to pack your entire life into a suitcase every day um and 
getting off stage and being completely fucking drained and all the rest of it. And, you know, there, there's a sort of, um, yeah, a physicality to it, which I miss enormously. Um, in some ways that can be quite challenging in the sense that I worry that I've forgotten how to do it. Um, you know what I mean? Or at least at the very least, I do genuinely need to get in shape before we go back on tour. Um, but, uh, but I will be doing that as soon as I can. Right on. Well, thanks so much for talking to me, Frank. It's been great. Catching Man, up. It's, it is a pleasure. <laughs>